This is Matt for Boxing Social in association with Forged Irish Stout Empire Fight Store, freebets.com. Dan, Raphael, it has been a while. I know you've been on the channel a few times um, since we last spoke. I know Lewis has had you on, but um, it's a pleasure for you to be back on. How's things, buddy? Things are good. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it, as always. Not a problem. Um, look, we've just finished watching. I know that we've both been watching Canelo Alvarez, Jaime Munguia, um, the press conference, Cinco de Mayo, two Mexicans, one pay-per-view star, pound for pound, one of the best in the world. Uh, Jaime Munguia, undefeated, impressive resume now as well. Um, this ticks a lot of boxes, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, listen, it's a, it's, a, it's a tremendous battle. I mean, I don't have any doubt about it that this is going to be an exciting fight. Now, I understand, and I'm certainly on that list of people that is uh, the, the, somebody that wanted to more, more preferably see Canelo Alvarez against David Benavides. You know, I think a lot of us did. Okay, but again, that doesn't detract from this being a really outstanding fight. Okay, he didn't do the Benavides fight, okay? But there's, that's, that's, that's done now. Okay, hopefully that will happen in the, in the future. Whatever. I'm not going to dwell on that because now, okay, it may be the second best fight out there, but it's still a pretty good damn fight between Canelo and Munguia. I'm not upset about it. I mean, you know, it's like you can always have a, a you know, just because it's your second choice doesn't mean it's not also outstanding. It's going to be a hell of a fight. I, I can't even imagine that it won't be a very exciting fight. It'll be a big crowd there. Obviously, Mexican holiday, so it's going to be a huge Mexican weekend. Uh, we'll all be Mexican for a weekend, I guess. That's the same way we're all Irish on St. Patrick's Day that just happened. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think um, when Canelo sort of was rumored to get touted to fight um, Charlo, there was obviously a very sort of unsure and a very sort of downbeat mood and attitude towards it from all sections in boxing. Um, but then when you talk about people wanting Benavidez, this is almost like you just said there, it's a very, it's quite a very good sort of second choice in terms of what Jaime Munguia brings to the table. Obviously, in Mexico, and that holiday weekend, undefeated record. You've also got the the thing of Golden Boy coming together again and, and being on a top table with Canelo Alvarez. I never never thought I'd see that, but boxing and money talks. Um, in terms of the fight itself, what type of fight are we expecting? We've seen them in with uh, the, a similar, same opponent in John Ryder and how they both handled him. What type of fight are you expecting? I mean, I expect, I think, what everybody expects, which is to have an exciting fight. I mean, it's not that complicated. I mean, I've seen Jaime Munguia fight a million times. He's going to go right after him and try to stand in the middle of the ring and bang him out, bang it out with him. And now that he's in his, uh, you know, in a, in a, just his second fight with Freddie Roach as his trainer, you know, you know, Freddie is a hall of fame trainer, one of the greats in the history of the sport, but his forte is as being an offensive minded trainer. So, you know, he'll try to shore up Jaime's defense a little bit, but he's preaches offense. He wants his guy to go out there and get him. He may look at Canelo being a little bit older, maybe a lot of rounds in the bank, a lot of miles on the tread, and maybe he's not at the apex of his career anymore. And they think that with the extreme pressure that Munguia can dish out and the fact that he's got such a good chin, or at least has shown that during the course of his career, that make it a firefight and maybe they can, you know, grind Canelo Alvarez down. And Canelo Alvarez, he's a great offensive fighter. He's a very underrated defensive fighter, in my opinion. He can fight going back. He can he can fight obviously coming forward. I think he's uh, well. His his chin is in, you know indisputable. He's taken you know huge shots from you know, lots of great punchers and great fighters through the years, and 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 also he's a very capable counter puncher. He likes to counter even though he can come forward. I just think it's going to be a tremendous battle. I think it'll be back and forth. Uh, they're both they're both really good at what they do. Canelo, you know, he's been a super middleweight a lot longer. He's been used to getting hit by the bigger guys. He obviously has fought at light heavyweight. Uh, yeah. You got to make Canelo the favorite, but this is a hell of a matchup. It's going to be you know sometimes, Matt, these fights are not fucking rocket science. You know what I mean? It's like, you take a Canelo Alvarez, you put him in the ring of Jaime Mangui, what the fuck do you expect? You're going to see a good fight. Yeah, 100%. Do you think, you mentioned there, you mentioned about Canelo's defensive skills. Do you think, um, even with all the accolades he's got, do you think sometimes he, he, he's a little bit underappreciated when you look at um, his ability in the ring and the fact that he is very well, you know, I'll say it like, He's got he's got a brilliant defense. I don't think sometimes he almost gets the credit he deserves for for being that good defensively. You just brought it up, so I just want to touch on that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to ever uh, put him in the same paragraph as a Pernell Whitaker or a Floyd Mayweather in terms of his defensive prowess, let's say. But he's not reckless. That's the thing that people. I mean, he's not a straight brawler. He doesn't fit the prototypical Mexican brawler style, like Munguia, frankly, does. He can do that. We've seen him do that at times. 
but he's a very cerebral fighter. He's very smart. He definitely uses his defense to his advantage at times. But he's not afraid to stand in there and get hit. That's why fans love him. But he absolutely has underrated defensive skills. He picks a lot of shots off. He moves his head pretty well. And, you know, he can, like I said, he can fight if he has to go him back a little bit. He doesn't like that. But he, he does – his natural instinct is to counterpunch. If you go back and watch him throughout his career, of course he can come forward and brawl. But there are many times in different fights where he takes the opportunity to, to, to lure a guy in and counter him. In terms of what uh, a victory would do for Jaime Mangia at this stage of his career, this would really catapult him into the spot of oh. anyone or anyone who obviously beats Canelo Alvarez. It shoots the stock through the roof. Um, on the flip side to that, a defeat for Canelo Alvarez at this stage of his career, how sort of damaging would that be? Well, I mean, when you're when you're the undisputed champion of the world and you lose a fight, obviously it's it's not good for your career because you've lost all the titles. If he loses, especially to another Mexican, I mean, that will probably uh, bring him down to some degree in the eyes of the Mexican boxing community. Uh, but, uh, you know, is it going to damage his legacy? I don't think so. The guy's, you know, his legacy is secure. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's an all-time great fighter. He's obviously an all-time great Mexican fighter. He's got the resume to back it up. He's got the accolades. He's got the hardware. He's made all the money. Um, you know, I'm sure he has a rematch clause. Uh, so, you know, if he loses... You know, it happens. Yeah. He's not going to be the first, nor will he be the last superstar to lose a boxing match. For Jaime Mingi, though, like you mentioned, it, it just sends him to the moon because you can't, you know, what's bigger? He just, not only does he keep his undefeated record, he comes becomes undisputed super middleweight champion and he'll have done so by beating, you know, the greatest fighter of his time and certainly in terms of his country, you know, as big of a fight as they can have in Mexico right now. 100%. In your heart of heart, if Canelo does get past Mungia. Um, when we've seen all these networks come together, obviously Amazon Prime, um, DAZN, um, with all the money and the things that are happening in boxing, we're seeing a lot more of a collaboration because of the money that's involved. Um, I know we're seeing it, we're seeing Saudi, things like that, but do you think we will get to see Benavidez and Canelo if Canelo comes through? Do you think that has to happen? Has to happen. That's, that's you know, we want to see it happen. I mean, it doesn't have to happen. I mean, Canelo is going to be the one that makes that choice. The sanctioning bodies can sticking with mandatories. In the end, Canelo Alvarez decides how his path, yeah. you got to respect that. And if he wants to fight David Benavides, the fight will happen. Now, remember, David is going to fight, uh, supposedly, uh, it's not, I don't know if it's like 100% signed, sealed, and delivered, but he's fighting Alexander Vodzik, supposed to be in June, probably on a card with Tank Davis and Frank Martin uh, yeah. that will take place. Uh, again, will be a prime video pay-per-view. And, uh, you know, if David comes through that, then, of course, there'll be a lot of conversations. because it'll only be a, a few weeks, you know, a month after the Canelo fight against Munguia. So if Canelo was the winner, obviously a lot of the conversation will start back up about what's going to happen for Canelo Alvarez in the September fight, which is, the, you know, the Mexican Independence Day weekend where he plans to have his second fight of 2024. So, of course, if he wins and if Benavides wins, we'll be hearing the same stuff we've been talking about and hearing about for the last couple of months, that that's the fight we want to see. And the question will be, what is Canelo's, uh, what's, what's he in the mood for? I don't think it's going to be a problem to get the David Benavides side on board. They've, they've been ready, willing, and able to do this for the last, you know, probably over a year to get this fight going. Uh, really, uh, and nothing will have changed. It will come down to Canelo Alvarez's decision about who he wants to fight and what kind of uh, financial package and, and those types of things it will take to get him in the ring against that opponent. You mentioned there, um, Javante Davis, and that card, a potential card coming up. Um, we'll come back to him in a second. I would want to touch on um, Tim Zhu. And obviously what's happened in the past sort of 48 hours with Keith Thurman's injury, um, Fundora steps in, um, completely different style, offers something, you know, completely different. So I would say a Keith Thurman um, with the belts on the line, Terence Crawford, now uh, mandatory for the winner of that fight. Um, in a way, although Thurman's dropped out, how do you see this fight? Are you, are you, are you excited to see this fight, to see how it plays out? I kind of like the fight. I kind of like it better than I like the Thurman fight, to tell you the truth. Just style wise, and Great. I know. From, listen, I know Fendora's coming off the knockout to Mendoza. I mean, that's not doesn't doesn't ha doesn't uh, diminish my interest in the fight because you know Fendora he was he won every single second of the fight before Mendoza, uh, you know, caught him, and that happens. But it, it doesn't take away from the interest. And and as you mentioned, it's a totally different style. It's one thing if you're a boxer and you're switching from a preparation to fight a right-handed fighter. Now you're gonna on 12 days notice fight a southpaw. Yeah. Now, on top of that, you're, you're going from fighting a Keith Thurman who's like 5'8", 5'9", 
Now you're stepping in with a Fundora who's six foot six. That's yeah. a big difference. And he's changing stances. Now I talked to Tim Zhu last night and asked him some of those questions about that. And I said, well, which is a bigger deal? Is it the swap from a from a orthodox fighter to a southpaw, or is it the height that's the biggest uh, uh, you know change you have to sort of game plan for? And he says, look, I I before the fight with Thurman was finalized, he thought and his team thought he was going to actually end up fighting in March against Erickson Lubin, who is also a PBC fighter that's a left-hander. And so before he officially opened his camp, he said he already done like 100 rounds of sparring with Southpaws. So he's comfortable with Southpaws, plus he's fought a couple during his career. So yeah. for him, he he wasn't really uh, freaked out about switching to a, a lefty on short notice. He said the more challenging aspect of it is the fact that, of course, uh, the height is such a huge difference that uh, it's highly unusual, of course, to be six foot six and be a 154 pounder. I mean, when you think about it like this, Tim Zhu uh, is going from fighting, like I said, a Keith Thurman is about five, eight, five, nine. And now Fundora is six foot six. Fundora is a 154 pounder. He's the same height as Vladimir Klitschko, who's a Hall of Fame former heavyweight champion. Vladimir Klitschko's reach is 81 inches. I actually looked this up, so that's why it's in my mind right now when I was writing about it the other night. His reach is 81 inches. Fundora, as a 54-pounder, his reach is 80 inches. So he's fighting a man who is the same uh, dimensions as a heavyweight other than the weight itself. But in terms of the reach and the height, that's a very, very big change to make. That's way bigger in my mind, and I, I, I'm not surprised that Zhu said this, than switching from fighting a right-handed fighter to a lefty because they've done that before and it's not it's not common for him but he had the 100 rounds in sparring so you know th that does add some intrigue plus Fandor is pretty good I mean I know he got again I know he got knocked out he's maybe not like a superstar elite pound for pound guy but he's a good quality 54 pound contender and so we're seeing that fight I, I mean I, I kind of like it yeah um I concur with everything you said there when I saw the change you're always a bit like well who are you going to bring in and when you see the change it's like there's a bit of jeopardy in that fight. You know, this guy is huge. Um, I think if Tim Zhu pulls this off and does it in, impression, in impressive fashion, that would be some statement considering the late change, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, not only that, but from, this, from the point of view of the stakes. Now, I understand why PBC did the Thurman fight and not Lubin, because it's a pay-per-view. Yeah. You, can, you can love it or hate it as a pay-per-view. That's a whole different conversation. But the facts were it's going to be on pay-per-view. Keith Thurman has a much bigger name. Keith has been on lots of big platforms. He's been on NBC and HBO and Showtime and, you know, ESPN. And he's been on all the big platforms. And so now as a name, uh, the value that he brings, it made it a more reasonable as a pay-per-view event, as opposed to anybody else that they had available at that moment. Once they decided to make the swap and, uh, and, and, and go with, you know, and then, so because of those, the Thurman fight, because he hadn't fought for a while, he had never really fought at 54 except a few fights early in his career. He was not ranked by the WBO. They declined to make it into a uh, world championship defense for Tim Zhu. Okay, fine. So now you're talking about a 155-pound non-title fight. Now, because of the unfortunate injury that Keith suffered to his biceps, they switched to Fundora. And so now he's, he's a top-ranked guy. He's only got the one loss. He's been fighting in that weight class, has obviously a credible reputation within the division considered uh, clearly a top 10 fighter in that weight class, you know, by any normal unbiased ranking. So now not only is it approved for Tim Zhu to defend the WBO title, Fandor was already on the undercard. So that's another thing about it. He, it's not like you're bringing him in on 12 days notice. He's been in a full training camp. Yeah, he was exactly. getting ready to fight Sir, Sir A. Boacek for the WBC's interim 54 pound title. I'm sorry, take that back for the vacant title because they had put Charlo as their in recess champion. So now this becomes Tim Zhu's WBO title and the vacant WBC title. So the stakes are raised in the main event because now it's a unification fight. Fundora with the chance to take both belts and, and Zhu with the chance to retain his title and add the vacant WBC title. So again, that's not, I mean, that, that's not the biggest thing in the world to me as a fan, but it definitely ratchets up sort of the stakes at, at hand here in this matchup. Especially with Crawford now waiting in the wings when you potentially like look at the steps coming ahead. Whoever wins that fight gets a fight with Terence, you know, further in the year. Tim, you know, Tim Zhu did it. You know, I'm sure it'd be a bit bigger fight. But that that interests you with Tim Zhu, Terence Crawford? Oh, absolutely. But I mean, just because they made him the mandatory doesn't necessarily mean the fight will happen. I mean, yeah, sure, you'd like to see it. I mean, obviously, I don't think Terence Crawford's ever fighting uh, in the welterweight division again. There's really, uh, you know, we've discussed this. I think there's no 
uh, logical superstar name. I mean, if you said he wanted to stay because he wants to fight a boot sentence or something like that, you know, that'd be great. But there, we all know that's not going to happen for a lot of different reasons, mainly because it just does not bring the kind of money that he can make, you know, yeah. fighting in a heavier weight class, going for another title, fighting a guy like Zoo who's got uh, a bigger name, even if he's not from the United States, even though the fight will be here in the United States. Yeah, um, yeah but I mean, assuming that, that Crawford is going to fight in the in the 54-pound weight class, is there a more interesting matchup in the division other than Zoo and Crawford if Zoo is the winner? You know, Charlo is not coming back anytime soon. He's not in the division, in my opinion. They made him the recess champion, but I doubt he'll ever fight again at 154. Yeah. You know, obviously, if Fandora wins, Zoo's going to have a rematch clause. So that 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 changes things around. I mean, I am told he does have a rematch clause. Not a surprise there. Um, but, yeah, it makes that the biggest, most interesting fight in the division because even though there's good, talented fighters in the win the weight class, you know, Zoo and Crawford are the best names out there. Yeah. 100%. Um, let's quickly, just before we go, come on to Javante Tank Davis. Um, him, uh, Frank Martin, undefeated fighter. Um, a good fight. Um, what do you make of this matchup? Obviously, Javante, um, a long time out the ring now again, it feels. Um, but an undefeated fighter. What, what do you make of this matchup, um, Dan? I mean, it's a reasonable fight. Uh, you mentioned that, that Tank's been out of the ring for a little bit. Obviously, he had the two fights in. 2023 he had the January fight and the big mega fight against Ryan Garcia, who he knocked out. And obviously uh, he went uh, to do his jail sentence. And when he came out of there, uh, they did not arrange a fight for him at the end of the year. I guess he, you know, not understandably just went through a, a situation being incarcerated, wanted yeah. to get his uh, life back together, you know, take some time to do that. Maybe he wasn't in the perfect fighting shape after spending some time behind bars. Uh, and frankly, had just made, you know, 40 plus million dollars or whatever it was to, for the tank, for the for the fight that he had against Ryan Garcia. So there was not a, you know, any kind of like desperate need for money to get back in the ring and all that. So, OK, so he took the rest of the time off. But if he does come back in June, if he goes April to June, you know, by today's boxing standards, it's oh. not the, the longest 14 months or so. It's not like some kind of, uh, you know, huge, huge mega layoff. And, you know, there was obviously uh, reasons because of the, the legal situation. Um, and Frank Martin. You know, he's he's a good fighter. He's got good skills, good talent. I liked him as a prospect coming up. Uh, you know, still still remain perplexed why he would turn down uh, the kind of money he did and the opportunity to fight for a title against Shakur Stevenson after his team agreed to it. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, he had agreed to it also and then backed right. out. He didn't endear himself to a lot of boxing people for that particular decision. Uh, it worked out for him because he's going to get this fight against Tank. But you never make that up. He didn't make any money in the past however many months it's been. Uh, you know, I'm sure he's making a good payday against uh, against Davis, but he had a chance to to beat Shakur, and he'll see if he can beat Travante Davis. But it's it's an okay fight. I mean, Frank has his his big win, if if you can call it a quote unquote big win, is you know he as an undefeated fighter, and Michelle Rivera also was undefeated, who was on the rise as well. They put their O on the record on the on the line against each other in a fight that neither one of them had to take. Yeah. And it was Frank Martin. He didn't just win the fight against Rivera. He looked great against him. He won every round. It was basically a shutout. Um, you know, Rivera had tested positive afterwards for a banned substance. So he was fighting uh, as a dirty fighter in that fight, took a, a suspension. Uh, and now Frank is getting back in the ring. So uh, that's a, it's a nice, I, I can't say I consider that a mega fight, but it's a good, it's a solid matchup between, you know, two of the top 10 lightweights out there. Ryan Garcia, Devin Haney coming up. Um, we've not spoke on this. I know you've probably touched on it with Lewis, but just quickly, um, the other thing that's come out with Ryan Garcia over the past month, do you have concerns this fight actually happens? I mean, if you just follow uh, just the actions that Ryan has taken, you have to be concerned about it. And I'm, not, I'm I'll am i be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm more concerned about Ryan Garcia as the human being than yes. whether this fight takes place because the man's life is more important than a boxing match. And clearly there's some issues going on there. And I, I want to see Ryan well, be well and be able to function, you know, not only as a boxer and do the big events for our sakes as fans, but just for your own sake, for your family's sake, for your children's sake, for your own sake, to get your house in order, get your life together before you worry about a boxing match. And yeah, I have my concerns. I mean, he's not acting rational, it seems to me. I don't believe that this is just trolling, as some people say, to somehow yeah. make the fight bigger when really what you've done is drive a lot of people away with some of the behavior. So, you know, I've got little, nothing but love for Ryan Garcia and I want to see him be well and get himself together. I mean, when he went through his, his uh, mental health issues that were a couple of years ago, you know, I have spoken to him at length about that in, in interviews and for some articles I have written 
and uh you know it's it's hard and so he maybe he's having some sort of issue like that uh yeah. it's not something for people to joke and laugh about i don't find it to be funny i find it to be concerning and uh, i want to see him take care of his business and so you know the new york state athletic commission uh is 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 wants to see him or talk to him or have him you know see a, med a mental health professional to make sure that that he is in the right frame of mind to be in the ring i mean commissions they give boxers physical tests and mris and and then uh cat scans and and they check their vision and take their blood tests and make sure they don't have any you know uh, diseases female boxers aren't pregnant that kind of thing but they don't do mental health assessments and i don't think that's an unreasonable thing you know when you've shown the type of actions that you have i know that ryan is not happy about it i've seen the video he put out about that but the string of posts on his social media platforms instagram and on twitter or x or whatever is is like it makes you like there's so much of it you can't even keep track of all the craziness yeah it's not even just like standard trolling where you go you know what we, we know what's going on here this has gone like way too far and like you said um i think everyone's on board with ryan garcia the human just making sure he's okay and um before any boxing takes place well look we've um Sort of chewed the fat over quite a few things there. I'm hoping to get to the States at some point again, one of these fights. Um, ideally Canelo and maybe one before that, but let's see how it pans out. Um, I appreciate you taking this interview on short notice. Always good to catch up. Um, I'm sorry my throat's a little bit hoarse, but I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm struggling a little bit this end. Um, but yeah, let's catch up soon. Appreciate your that time. That sounds good, man. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Thank you.